is everybody. Oops, guest service is over. Hi, welcome to Renovate. I'm your handyman, Kevin. Have you ever had wax spilled on your uh, furniture before? Well, around here on Christmas Eve and candlelight services, we often get wax on our furniture and we have came up with a perfect method for removing wax such as this from your fabric. We're gonna start out with a pre-warmed iron and a paper towel, very simple. Lay the paper towel onto the wax, apply the iron. You can continue to pull the paper towel under the iron until you see absolutely no more wax coming through the paper towel. And before you know it, it's all gone. Your wax is stuck in your paper towel, and that's it. Thanks for joining us each week as we've been talking about renovating your home and your life. Hello, Heritage. I want to welcome all of you at each of our locations. Thanks for being here. This is week five of Renovate, a series where we're looking at realities in life and family through the metaphor of a home, where each room of the home represents an area of our lives, and we're trying to figure out which of those areas might be in need of some repair or some renovation. And this week, we're stepping into the bedroom to talk about sex. Yes, I said sex, S-E-X, sex. And now some of you are like, oh my goodness, are you, can you say that word in church? Some of you are like, already, this is the best weekend ever. <laughs> and yet still some of you are sitting here, maybe a guest with us, thinking, what in the world did I get myself into? But I want all of you to know that we are simply having a God-honoring conversation about a God-given gift. And whether you feel excited or curious or awkward, uncomfortable, the reality is we need to have this conversation. We get to have this conversation because everywhere we go in our world, we typically find some element of sex. It's everywhere. It's in our news. It's in the movies. It's in sports headlines. It's even in cartoons these days. And depending on what, which TV show you're watching, just about every other commercial can be sex related. Maybe KY His and Hers or Victoria's Secret. And quite honestly, they've got their own fashion show on TV now. It's everywhere. It's marketed in magazine stands in stores all around. Or how to please your man, how to have the best orgasm ever. <gasps> did he just say orgasm in church? Yes, he did. Is he allowed to do that? Yes. Look, friends, God created the orgasm. God created sex. The reality is for us that we are sexual beings. And we live in a world that is sex-saturated. We live in a world that is, that everywhere we look, this is an exposure to it. And, and the TV is, is one place, the movies are another, the web is the worst, the internet's the worst. We get spam mail that is connected to sex. If, if you searched sex, the word sex in Google five years ago, you'd get 536 million results. And if you searched it today, you'd find nearly 2 billion results. We, are, we live in a sex-saturated culture. Our kids are talking about it. The middle school's filled with it. It's everywhere. Everywhere we turn, we encounter it, except the one place we probably should, the church. And throw in some Christian homes into that. We're, we're uncomfortable with it, so we don't talk about it. And churches and parents walk around with blinders on saying, don't say anything, don't say anything, don't ask me, I don't want to tell you. But when we do that... We leave and position the world to teach our kids about this God-given gift. And that's crazy. Because the world has shown they don't know what they're talking about. Look, just, just take in mind the, the recent release of the movie Fifty Shades of Grey, based on the book of the same title. Who's heard of this thing? Oh yeah, like a whole bunch of people. Look, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Wow. What an attempt to redefine what is natural and acceptable and normal in an intimate relationship. Just the fact that that thing was released on Valentine's Day weekend shows an effort to redefine romance. And let me just be clear. Let me just be clear. Violence between partners, emotional abuse, the imbalance between control and submission is never a reflection of a healthy, loving relationship. Never. 
And when we elevate a sexual sadist to the platform and position of romantic hero, we've communicated a message to everyone, including our kids, an unhealthy message about this God-given gift of sex. And it puts everyone at greater risk to be abused or to become an abuser. It's not good. It's not good. But the world says sex is just something we do. Sleep with someone, go to bed with someone. It's just about self-gratification. Do it. Get some. Get a piece. It's just about the momentary reality. It's not about life. It's just what happens in the moment. It doesn't matter anywhere else. So you can sleep with whoever you want, whenever you want. Just make sure it's consenting sex and safe sex. And if you're thinking about getting married, you need to have sex because you wouldn't buy a car if you didn't test drive it. So you need to try out sex first. And if it doesn't work out, friends with benefits, that's okay and normal. No! We couldn't be more wrong. Look, I know some of you are excited and curious about this message, but yet some of you are still a little uncomfortable, a little awkward about it. But look, listen, we are sexual beings. And guess who made us that way? God. And it couldn't be more appropriate to talk about this subject in the context of the church. Yet I know there's still some uncomfortability. Every time I say the word sex, some of you are still squirming in your seat a bit. So let's get this out of our system, all right? Let's just get this out of our system. Here's what I want you to do. At all of our locations, here at Rock Island and every other location, I want you on the count of three, I want you to say the word sex, all right? So here we go. And do it with meaning. So here we go. One, two, three. Sex. All right. That was okay. But I'm looking for passion. I'm looking for commitment and conviction and desire. So here we go. I want to do it again. One, two, three. There we go. Now turn to somebody and say, God made sex. Turn to somebody and tell them that. Tell as many people as you want, God made sex. Now turn back and say, sex is good. Tell them sex is good. Tell them it's very good. All right. Now look, some of you had some fun with that. Others of you, others of you were like, that was the most awkward thing and kind of conversation I could have with a stranger. And some of you didn't even do it. <laughs> but that's okay. Listen, I hope you're a little more ready to have this conversation. Because look, the bedroom, the bed, this is a place of health. It's a place of rest. It's where we start our day and end our day. The bedroom is a place that we prepare to meet the world. And it can be a place of fun. Fun. You know what one of my favorite things to do in the bedroom is? Uh-oh, where's he going with this? <laughs> Let me tell you, I love to jump on the bed. It's fun. Who's with me? Come on. The bedroom could be a fun place. It can be a place that, that's just plain old cozy, where we just cuddle up, snuggle in, and, and we just get to be ourselves, and we can be in solitude and reflection. But it's also a place that we express our sexuality. But yet, being such a significant place, we hear very little about it. Maybe we're told, don't jump on the bed, and don't have sex in it, and oh yeah, by the way, don't rip off this thing, because it's against the law, under penalty of law. You know, it's, it's crazy that we hear so little about this part of our lives. We don't, nobody talks to us about what to do with our, with our desires and our interests and our passions and arousal. At best, maybe we get to go take a cold shower advice. But certainly don't talk about it. Just pretend you don't have urges. Don't share those desires. Don't, don't discuss it. Don't talk. La, 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 dirty, bad. No, 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 we don't want to talk about it. Look, it's not dirty or bad. It is beautiful. God created sex to be a place that ultimate true intimacy is expressed when we do it the right way. And I mean that in every possible way. I, I know that there are some people who, who their bed right now is a great place of, of, of love and trust and, and true intimacy. And that's, that's awesome. But I also know that for some, the bed is a place of rebellion and regret and shame. And for some, it's a place of loneliness because you're living the life of a widow 
or a single life. And for some, the bed is a place of neglect and abuse. Even in the context of marriage, the bedroom can be the place where you find the greatest separation, laying next to your spouse but yet still miles apart. Look, we can try to avoid a conversation about the bedroom. We can say it's uncomfortable, it's taboo, it's really nobody else's business. But the bedroom is a room in the home that if we don't tend to and steward and care for, can destroy and erode the rest of the house from the inside out. God made us sexual beings. And we need to know the why and the what for. You know, it's not all that hard to know and understand what God asks of us. He's already shown us what he wants. He, he does it through his Holy Spirit, and he does it through his word, the Bible, which is why the prophet Micah could write these words in chapter 6. He says, but he's already made it plain how to live, what to do, what God is looking for in men and women. The Bible is God's love letter to us. It's a place that he reveals himself. He reveals his plan. He reveals his purpose. What, was, what is contained within the scriptures reveals principles that allow us and teach us how to live. And one of the key principles that contained within scripture is that we are supposed to live as givers, not as takers. You and I are supposed to live as givers, not as takers. We're supposed to live as givers, not what? takers. Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than receive. We're supposed to live as givers in this life, not as takers. It's a principle that God has woven into the very fabric of all of creation. We've talked about a principle before that's similar, like the principle of harvest, where we're supposed to buy and plow and plant and water and weed and then harvest. That there is a, a need and a, and a desire and a structure that we're supposed to be investing and cultivating and nurturing and developing to, to yield fruit, to reap a harvest. But too many people want to live as takers and just hang out and harvest and take and harvest and take and take and take and not do the due diligence of properly caring for and nurturing and investing in and the rest of the journey to reap the harvest God has for us. And we live as takers rather than givers. It's true in gardens. It's true in business. It's true in relationships. We're supposed to be givers, not takers. Now, it's far easier to be a taker. It's easy to be a taker. It's hard to be a giver. Because ultimately, I, we're, we're fundamentally selfish. We, we want to see what we get before we give. We want to know the return on our investment before we step into it. And we can even justify being a taker if someone has taken from us. But God says, give. Give as I have given. You and I, we, we're supposed to be givers, not takers. And I want to show you how, how this works and how we know this. In fact, it's God in his infinite and perfect wisdom set boundaries and limits over areas of life. They are not rules to control, they are principles to protect. God set up these boundaries and limits to, so, so we know how to live, so we know his purpose, so we can live according to his plan and according to his will. In fact, you can think about it in terms of kind of like a, a patio umbrella where God has taken and established an umbrella over every area or part of life. And he says, look, within this area of life, you need to function under the umbrella. If you remain under the umbrella in this area of life, then I will be able to bless you. I will provide for you. I will lead you. My Holy Spirit will be upon you. Here is infinite freedom and favor. Out there is not. Yet, this is why when Jesus talked about in John 15, he says, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Under the umbrella, we can bear fruit. Yet we think we can go outside the umbrella and still win in life. But we can't. We think that we can experience everything God has for us out here. But we can't. It is under the umbrella that we experience infinite freedom and favor and God's blessing. And it's outside the umbrella that we experience fractures. 
And this is true in every area of life. In business, in family, in communities, in marriage, in relationships, in intimacy, and in sex. Under the umbrella we find favor. Outside the umbrella we find fractures. And the truth is, everyone pays a price outside the umbrella. Everyone pays a price outside the umbrella. No ifs, ands, or buts. And if we don't understand the nature of the umbrella, if we don't understand God's principles that protect those parameters, then we can struggle and we can end up wandering outside the umbrella and then we wonder where God's favor is. We, we wander and then we wonder. When we don't understand the umbrella, we find ourselves in that place. If we don't understand the umbrella, we can actually think that he has an umbrella that looks more like this. And we think, God, you want me to, you want me to stay under this? This is all you allow? That is not only unfair, impossible, and ridiculous, it makes no sense. But look, this is not God's umbrella. This is not how he functions. His umbrella is wide and broad, and underneath it is infinite freedom and infinite favor. Under we find favor, outside we find fracture. We find what under? Favor. favor. Outside we find fractures. We're supposed to be givers who receive, not takers who get. Yet outside the umbrella, we become takers. Especially in the area of sex. So let's take this back to the bedroom, because God has an umbrella over the bed. It's an umbrella that if we stay under the umbrella in our bed, then we find favor. Outside the umbrella, we find fractures. Have you ever noticed that men and women are different? Yeah, oh, duh. kind of obvious, right? We think different, we relate differently, we even look differently. We're even different in the bedroom, and not just anatomically. We're very different in the bedroom, just, just for men. Like, it, most men, you just, men see a, 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 a naked woman, it doesn't take a matter of seconds until they're like, I'm interested, count me in. And in some ways, it's almost like at the flip of a switch, we can get turned on, right, guys? It's kind of like this. If you can illustrate it this way, it's like with one flip of a switch, a man's ready to roll. It doesn't take all that much. Visually stimulated, we're ready to roll. But women are much different. Much different. They're, they're a little more complex. There's a few more layers to it. It kind of looks like this. It's pretty straightforward. You just got to turn the right knob at the right time to the right place, flip the right switch in the right sequence, and everything's good. If you don't, ain't nothing turning on. And men, you know this, once you figure this out, you're like, I got it. I figured it out. The next day, it all changes. Amen? Look, I, I know I'm exaggerating a little bit. I know that. But the reality is men and women are different. Men and women are different, but we're all, both ultimately looking for the intimacy of connectedness. However, we find a much lesser thing if we go about it the wrong way. See, far too often, men use love to get sex, and women use sex to get love. Men approach it with a posture of self-gratification, achievement of conquering, and use phrases like, I got some, I got a piece, and... And women, desire to be loved, valued, and protected, can use sex to manipulate. They give and withhold sex and to get what they need or what they want. And both paradigms are wrong. Both fall short. See, neither is good. Because we've both used a God-given gift in a God-forbidden way. We lust. We surf the internet, looking to satisfy ourselves through masturbation. That's men and women. We strip people of the image of God in them. We take their humanity from them and we use them for our sexual fantasies. We treat people as objects or products, stripping them and stripping ourselves in the process. And we don't see that we're takers in that moment, creating fractures for us and others. But God has a different perspective on all of that. God, God made sex. It is good. It is a gift. And he's not surprised or disappointed when we have desires. He's disappointed when we use them outside the umbrella. 
He just wants us to stay under the umbrella so he can bless, so he can lead, he can pour out his spirit upon us. Hebrews 13, 4 says this, Marriage should be honored by all, the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. Look, the world says just do it. Do it as much as you want. Do it with whoever, whenever you want. But that's outside God's design and umbrella. And it leads to fractures, ultimately destroying our capacity for true intimacy. It's, they're, they're just things we shouldn't be doing. And we all know there are things in life we just shouldn't do. It's why we have warnings on different products. So some of those things should be obvious, but there are some things that, that maybe need to be said. Like, don't remove the tag from a mattress. Well, here's a couple other warning labels maybe you've seen before. Maybe you think they're a little too obvious. Here's the first one. Don't use while sleeping. This was on a hair dryer. <laughs> yeah. Like, duh. No kidding. Here's another one. Do not iron clothes on body. What do you think that was on? Yeah, clothes iron. Come on, some warnings are like obvious. We should know better. Here's one more. Wearing of this garment does not enable you to fly. You know what this is on? A Superman costume. <laughs> Look, there are some things you think, like, we should know that. We should, that should be obvious. We shouldn't have to be told. But there are other things, actually, it is helpful that we need the reminder to avoid problems. And God gives us warnings in regards to sex in his word. One of those places is Leviticus 18. And there's a list there, and some of those things might be obvious to you. Maybe not. Some of them are like, you know, don't have sex with your parents. Don't have sex with your siblings. Don't have sex with animals. There's a whole list. You can check it out. You can read it at some point. But understanding what God says fits under the umbrella is important. Partly because sex is not like other sins. It's not. It's why Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 6 these words. Flee from sexual immorality. So that would be anything outside the umbrella. All other sins, that would be the non-sex sins, a person commits are outside the body. But whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Sexual sin is not like other sins. It runs deep. It takes from you. It takes from the one you're with. And it takes from the one you're supposed to be with. Sexual sin takes a toll on human beings like no other sin. And whether you've been a taker in this area or you've had more taken from you in this area, many of us find ourselves in a place where we don't know what to do next. We've tried to move past it. We've tried to forgive, tried to forget. We've tried to stop thinking about it, tried to stop doing it, but we can't. And the truth is, we can't fix it. We can't make it right. We can't undo the past. We wish we could. Oh, man, we so wish we could. But the wound is too deep. We can't fix it. We can't undo it. But there is hope. You don't have to live in the burden of shame and guilt and the confusion of your sexual journey. Because ultimately, sex is a God-given gift for a God-driven purpose. And he claims authority over it. We need and can get sexually healthy. God wants us to have great sex. He's invented sex. It was his idea. So let's take a look at God's perspective. And if you have a Bible, you can turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. This is where God establishes the order of all things. He creates everything. First, in the first four days, he creates light and land and oceans and plants. And then he moves to sea life and birds in day five. In day six, he moves to animals. And then as he steps into day seven, he changes a pattern. He goes from saying, let there be, let there be, let there be, to let us make. And it has significant implications. So this is Genesis chapter 1, starting with verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image. I mean, just hold right there. That let us part is the Trinity. It's, it's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's God, Jesus, and His Spirit. And if you didn't know this, Jesus has existed before all time, before He came here as a baby. Go to John chapter 1, you can find that out. But it is the three of them, the three in one saying, let us make them in our image, mankind, men and women, 
in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So in this creating moment, we are both physical and spiritual in his image made. So he created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Now, what can we learn from this particular passage of Scripture? Well, the deal is, God loved us enough to make us in his image, so go, now go have sex. Under the umbrella. Under the umbrella. God directs us to. God is pro-sex for pleasure and procreation. Can you just imagine how that whole thing went down on day seven, where he's sitting there and he's going like, I'm going to make humanity, and I'm going to make them for fellowship with me, and I'm going to make them, uh, I'm going to give them life, and then I'm going to make them in my image, and oh yeah, I'm going to give them this crazy cool gift of sex for their pleasure and for their ability to recreate, to multiply. I gave them sex, and it is good. But we've twisted it. And we've moved it outside the umbrella. And we've taken what was beautiful and we've distorted it. We are made in the image of God, physical and spiritual. We're not like the rest of creation. We're not an animal. There's masculine and there's feminine. It's reflected in the marriage relationship. And an intercourse under the umbrella reflects that oneness. It reflects him. That's why in chapter 2, it goes on to say that this is why a man will leave his father and mother and, and, and cling to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Look, the problem isn't that we think about sex. That's not the problem. The problem is we don't think deep enough about sex. We don't think deeply enough about it. Because sex is, is more about what we are than what we do. It's more about what we are than what we do. Our desire for God, our connectedness, is reflected in our desire for connectedness with each other and Him. And the world lied. We are not animals. We are sexual beings. In fact, humans were sexual before they were sinful. Think about that for a moment. And sex is more about what we are as image bearers than what we do. It's not just an act. It's a reflection of who we are. It's a reflection of God. And it's one reason why we, come, we can come back from sexual sin. Because it's God's thing. It's his thing. Yet we've taken it and made it our thing. That's why Paul wrote in verses 19 and 20 of chapter 6 in 1 Corinthians, do, do, don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself, for, for God bought you with a high price, so you must honor God with your body. We don't belong to ourselves. We are unique, made in the image of God, not like the rest of creation. We're not like animals. We don't just breed. There's a uniqueness to humans, and it's rooted in the image we bear. And because of that, how we treat the creation reveals how we feel about the Creator. How you and I treat the creation reveals how we feel about the creator. How we interact with people, how we interact with this world reveals how we feel about the one who created it. And we are not like animals. There is a proper place, a proper time, and a proper amount. And God intends for sex to be enjoyed within a marriage. A God-given gift for a God-given purpose. It's the ultimate expression of intimacy between husband and wife. It's not just an activity for whoever, whenever. And anything outside the umbrella is taking, it's fracturing, it's destroying our own body and our soul. Intimacy is a gift. In fact, intimacy involves much more than sex. In one sense, we can look at it like a wheel, an intimacy wheel with different parts, and each part contributes to the whole. And, and when we have all those parts filled in, then, then it's strong. Well, even if we're missing one part, it weakens it. And we may figure out some way to invest in each of these areas, but if we don't have a relationship with God, if we don't have our right relationship with Him, then our relationship with any other person is going to be limited. Intimacy is a gift He gives. In fact, that whole not marrying an unbeliever, not being unequally yoked, that's not a, that's not a rule to control. That is a principle to protect. Because in the marital relationship, without that spiritual ability to connect to God and to each other, it's fractured and the oneness is compromised. 
Because intimacy isn't just about sex. It's about the other parts of the process as well. And if we don't have intimacy with God, we can't experience full intimacy with other people. Our relationship with every other person is impacted by the status of our relationship with God as spiritual beings. We need Jesus to position us for more. Intimacy is a gift he gives. So what? What do we do now with all of this? Well, bottom line is, sex outside the umbrella has never made life better. Sex outside the umbrella has never made life better. It always, 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 always complicates it. Think about it. Can you think of a time where sex outside of God's design ever improved life? Premarital sex, sexual perversion, lust with pornography. No. I'm not talking about momentary pleasure. I'm talking about life improvement. It never has. And it's true for everybody. So there are two things that I want all of us to just consider as we wrap up our time. They're, they're what I'm calling R-rated next steps because they both start with the letter R. That's it. The first one is to remain. Remain. Remain faithful. Remain pure. Remain under the umbrella. God is faithful, but we have to remain under the umbrella. Listen, it is possible, and it is worth, a, worth it. The media won't say it, but God does. Remain. It is worth the wait. If you are single, the short-term or long-term sacrifice for eternal gain is worth it. And if you are married, it is, remaining to preserve your marriage is worth it. If you're thinking about stepping outside the umbrella, if you're looking, if you're already cheating, if, if you're taking, stop, don't do it. Temptation is very real. We all know far too well about temptation. But trading momentary pleasure for a lifetime of pain is always foolish. Always foolish. Remain. Here's a challenge for our married brothers and sisters. Seek to have more intimacy as a giver this week than a taker with your spouse. Invest in the rest of the wheel, every part of the wheel, for the good of your spouse, and then watch what God does. Watch what he does. If you need help in this journey, then get some help. Go see a counselor. But intimacy in the marriage relationship isn't just about you. It's about you and your spouse and your Lord. Remain. If you're single, I want to challenge you to find int intimacy with God now. Find it now. If you find it now first, then your marriage and life will forever be changed. Ladies, find your identity in Christ now so it won't ever be in your man. And men, Lean into pursuing intimacy with God now so you learn how to die to self and will be able to truly love your bride as you should. Find intimacy now. If you're tempted to wander, don't. Remember what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 when he said this, so if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And then he goes on to say this, and God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Remain. Remain. Don't take it for granted. Work for it. Be vigilant in it. We live in a sex-saturated culture, and no one is above temptation. And if you are currently living under the umbrella, stay there. Remain. Stay alert. If you're thinking about stepping outside, don't do it. Don't do it. Sex outside the umbrella has never, ever made life better. Not even once. Remain. The second thing, return. Return. Return to God's standard of sexuality. Come back under the umbrella. Look, I know that some here today are right now sexually active outside of marriage. And, and you think no one knows, and you think it doesn't matter, and it's hurting no one. But it is, and it does. It's taking from you, it's taking from the one you're with, and it's taking from the one you're supposed to be with now or later. It does matter. For some, you're consumed with sexual thoughts, with lust, and, and it's led to this unhealthy expression, even an addiction. 
even others of you are actually struggling to find true intimacy in your marital relationship. Some are even struggling having been married, but, but no longer by death or by divorce. You're now alone in the marriage bed, yet you're still a sexual being. You're still a sexual being. Remain and return. Remain and return. If, if, you've, if you've messed up already, let me tell you, there is hope. If they have messed up already, let me tell you, there is hope. And you may say, Sean, you don't understand. I have taken so much. I've slept with so many other people. I've compromised so many times. My bed is a place of regret and shame, and it doesn't matter anymore. And I'm telling you, it does matter. It does matter. Return. Remain. You may think, you know what, Sean, I, I've already taken. I've taken every day on the computer in my thoughts. I've even taken from the innocent. Is there hope for me? And I say, yes, there is, by the power of the blood of Jesus. By the power of the blood of Jesus, by his sacrifice, his death, his resurrection, he makes all things new. But you've got to return and you've got to remain. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Look, that one verse captures all we really need to know about returning and remaining. That if we confess, and then, then we can find forgiveness, and then he purifies us by his power at work in us. And now we live as this new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. Everything's different. Listen, if you have messed up already, there is hope. God makes all things new, but you have to return to the place under his umbrella. He can restore you through Jesus. What was no longer has to be. And it may be a journey. It may take time, but that journey can start today. When you return, when you confess, when you find forgiveness and you ask him to purify you. If you've never done that on the back of the sermon note guide or just the beginning steps of that journey, you can have that conversation with, to, with God today and you can step from outside the umbrella and from fractures into a, a relationship under the umbrella where you find favor. But we have to return and remain. Look, for some of you, this journey will require others to be involved, counselors, accountability partners. That's all good and that's essential. But it's through Jesus that we're transformed. In time, through Christ, God will heal you. He will heal you and he will provide an intimacy that is actually better than sex. <laughs> some of you are like, what? No way. Yeah, really. We, we may need to reconcile with some people we've taken from along the way. We may need to confess to our spouse or a counselor. We may need to get help in that journey. But it all starts with submitting ourselves in relationship to Jesus. Submitting ourselves under the umbrella. Returning if we've wandered. Letting him heal the fractures. Letting him restore favor. Remain and return. I hope every time you see an ad for an R-rated movie, you ask the question if you're remaining or if you're, you need to return. It is just too important not to know. And I don't know where you're at in your journey, but I do know that it's a, a question I think we all need to wrestle with is this. What do you need to do this week to honor God with your sexuality? What do you need to do this week to honor God with your sexuality? We are sexual beings. He's created us that way. But he's done it for a purpose, to bring himself glory when we stand under the umbrella. And I don't know if you need to return or if you need to remain. But if you're pushing the edge of the umbrella and you're spending more time with people you shouldn't and you're driving past the house one more time of the person you know you shouldn't drive past, back off. Trading a momentary pleasure for a lifetime of pain is foolishness. And our God calls us to bring Him glory in every area of our lives. So as we take time to step now in a moment of prayer and back into worship, my prayer is that all of us will be a people who seek His face, who remain under the umbrella, and if we've wandered, we would return and allow Him by the power of His Son, Jesus, to transform us. What do you need to do this week to honor God with your sexuality? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity to have a conversation which for some was exciting and interesting and others maybe a bit uncomfortable. But, but ultimately, God, you have made us, created us to be sexual beings and, and you've done it with a, for a purpose, not only for our pleasure, but for your glory. And I pray, Father, that as my brothers and sisters process their sexual journey with you, that you would help all of us hear from you, 
that we would reconcile and ask for forgiveness in the areas that we've messed up, we've stepped outside the umbrella. For areas that we're tempted to wander, maybe back off from those quickly and we'd settle down into a place where we remain under your umbrella, where we can experience your freedom and your favor. But may we all know what we need to do this week to more fully and carefully honor you with our sexuality. May you be glorified in and through us. May you heal and redeem what has been fractured. And may you bring glory to yourself by every part of what we do and say, every area of the house, but particularly in this area. May you do a new thing by the power of the blood of your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.